All right, we're on chapter 186. I'll just warn you right now, I think one of my neighbors around here is building something because I keep hearing hammering. So I will just apologize now if that comes through on the video. All right, chapter 186, The New Cut. At nine o'clock on the same evening, Mr. Greenwood, muffled in a coat, alighted from a hackney cab in the Waterloo Road at the corner of The New Cut. That wide thoroughfare which connects the Waterloo and Blackfriars, Blackfriars Road is one of the most busy and bustling after its own fashion in all London. Nowhere are the shops of a more miscellaneous nature, nowhere are the pathways so thronged with the stalls and baskets of itinerant vendors. The ingenuity of those petty provision dealers adapts the spoiled articles of the regular fishmonger and butchers to serviceable purposes in the free market of the new cut. The fish is cut in slices and fried in an oil or butter whose rancid taste obviates the putrid flavor and smell of the comestible, and the refuse scraps from the butcher's shop are chopped up to form a species of sausage balls. Then the grease in which the racy slices of fish and savory compounds of lights and livers have been alike cooked serves to fry large rounds of bread, which, when thus prepared, are denominated sop in the pan. Of course, these culinary refinements are prepared by the vendors in their own cellars or garrets hard by. But when conveyed to the miscellaneous market in the new cut, sorry, I got to turn the page. <laughs> the luxuries impart a greasy and sickening odor to the air. It is perfectly wonderful to behold the various methods in which the poor creatures in that thoroughfare endeavor to obtain an honest livelihood. And although their proceedings elicit a smile, still they had better ply their trades their strange trades thus, then rob or beg. There may be seen, for instance, a ragged urchin holding a bundle of onions in his hand and shouting at the top of his shrill voice, here's a haporth, and no matter how finely dressed the passerby, he is sure to thrust the onions under his or her very nose, still vociferating, here's a haporth. Poor boy, he thinks everyone must want onions. The immediate vicinity of the Victoria Theatre is infested with women who offer playbills for sale and who seem to fancy it impossible that the passers-by can be going anywhere else than to the play. Here an orange girl accosts the gentleman with two or three of the fruit in her hand, but with a significant look which gives the assurance that her real trade is of a less innocent nature. There are a poor woman with an array of children before her, offers loose for matches, but silently appeals for alms. A little farther on is a long barrow covered with toys and a tall man with a nose shouts at intervals, only a penny each, only a penny each. Some of these gimcracks excite astonishment by their extreme cheapness, but they are chiefly made by the convicts in Holland and are exported in large quantities to England. In the middle of the road, a man with a stentorian voice offers a hundred songs for a penny and enumerating the list, he is sure to announce the return of the Hadmiral amongst the rest. Nearly opposite the Victoria Theatre, there is an extensive cook's shop and around the window stands a hungry crowd feasting their eyes on the massive joints which are intended to feast the stomach. In front of the butcher's shop, the serving man keeps up a perpetual vociferation of buy, buy, a sort of running fire that, de that denotes the earnestness with which competition is carried on amongst rivals in that delectable trade. Perhaps a new baker's shop is opening in the new cut, and then a large placard at the window announces that a glass of gin will be given to every purchaser of a quartern loaf. The buyers do not pause to reflect that the price of the cordial is deducted from the weight of the bread. The pawnbroker's shop seems to drive a most bustling trade in the new cut, and the fronts of their establishments present a more extensive and miscellaneous assortment of second-hand garments, blankets, handkerchiefs, and sheets than is to be seen elsewhere. The influx and efflux of people at the public houses and the gin shops constitute not the least remarkable feature of that neighborhood where everything is dirty and squalid, yet where everyone appears able to purchase intoxicating liquor. On the southern side of the new cut, there are a great many second-hand furniture shops. The sheds wherein the articles are principally exposed, being built against the houses in a fashion which gives the whole, when viewed by the glaring of the gaslights, the appearance of a bazaar or fair. The new cut is always crowded, but the multitude is not entirely in motion. Knots of men congregate here and groups of women there, the posts at the corner of the alleys and courts or the doors of the gin shops being the most favorite points of such assembly. The edges of the pathways are not completely devoted to provision dealers. Penny peep shows emblazoned with a colored drawing 
representing the last horrible murder. Itinerant quacks with certain remedies for the toothache, stalls covered with odd numbers of cheap periodical publications, old women seated on stools behind little trays containing combs, papers of needles, reels of cotton, pack thread, stay laces, bobbins, and such like articles, men with cutlery to sell and who flourish in their hands small knives with innumerable blades sticking out like the quills on a porcupine. These are also prominent features in that strange market. Such are the new cut and its tributary lanes. And it was now along the new cut that Mr. Greenwood, enveloped in his cloak, was pursuing his way. He scarcely noticed the turmoil, bustle, and business of that strange thoroughfare, for he was too much absorbed in his own meditations. The truth was that his affairs, once so gloriously prosperous, were now rendered desperate by various reverses, and he was about to seek a desperate means of retrieving them. The reader cannot have failed to observe that the characters of George Montague Greenwood and Richard Markham stand out from our picture of London life in strong contrast with each other. And it is not the less remarkable that while the former was rising rapidly to wealth, rank, and eminence, the latter was undergoing persecutions and sinking into comparative poverty. Now, at the epoch which we are describing, the tables seem to have turned. For while George Montague Greenwood is about to seek a desperate remedy for his desperate affairs, Richard Markham is leading a gallant army army over the fertile plains of Castelcicala. The former, then, may be deemed the personification of vice, the latter the representative of virtue. They have chosen separate paths. The sequel will fully demonstrate which of the two characters had selected the right one. In the meantime, we will continue our narrative. Mr. Greenwood pursued his way, and having crossed over the southern side of the new cut, repaired to a small row of private houses, of which this famous thoroughfare can boast at the extremity joining the Black Friars Road. Where he stopped for a moment, there he stopped for a moment beneath a lamp to consult a memorandum in his pocket book, and having thereby refreshed his memory in respect to the address of which he was in search, he proceeded to knock at the door of a house close by. A dirty servant girl opened it just as far as a chain inside would permit and protruding her face said with strange abruptness, well, what is it? Does Mr. Pennywhiff live here? Demanded Mr. Greenwood. No, he don't. And if he did, you wouldn't come in because I know it's all your gammon, returned that most uninteresting specimen of female domestic race. Why not? Exclaimed Greenwood indignantly. Whom do you take me for? For what you are, replied the girl. And what am I then? Why, a execution, to be sure. And with these words, the girl banged the door in Mr. Greenwood's face. I must have taken down the wrong number in my memorandum, thought the member of Parliament, as he turned away from the house, which was evidently in a state of siege. This is very provoking. He then knocked at the door of the next house. A woman with a child in her arms answered the summons, and without waiting for any question, said abruptly, You'd better walk in. Greenwood entered accordingly, supposing that the woman had overheard his inquiry next door and that he had now found the abode of the person whom he sought. The woman led the way into a back room, almost completely denuded of furniture, smelling awfully of tobacco smoke and very feebly lighted with a small candle that wanted snuffing. In the midst of a dense cloud of that vapor, a man without a coat was sitting on a trunk. But the moment Greenwood entered, this individual threw down his clay pipe and advanced toward the visitor, exclaiming in a ferocious voice, so you're going your rounds at this hour, are you? Well, I'm as far off from having the tin as I have been all along, and as I'm going away tomorrow, I don't mind if I give you a good drubbing to teach you how to pester a gentleman with shabby bits of paper in future. Thus speaking, the ferocious individual advanced toward Greenwood, squaring away like clockwork. Really, sir, you must labor under some mistake, exclaimed the member of Parliament. I have never called here before in my life. And who the devil are you? demanded the pugilistic phenomenon. That is quite another question, said Greenwood. I, do you mean to tell me then, exclaimed the man, that you ain't the water rates? No, I'm not, answered Greenwood, unable to suppress a smile. I thought that a Mr. Pennywhiff lived here. Then he don't, that's all, was the rejoinder. Blowed if I don't believe it's a plant after all. Come, ain't you a bum? No lies now. Greenwood turned indignantly away from the room and left the house, muttering to himself, this is the most extraordinary. Everyone appears to be in difficulties in this street. He was not, however, disheartened. It was highly necessary for him to see the person of whom he was in search, and he accordingly knocked at another door. "'Tell him I'll send round the money tomorrow,' shouted a masculine voice inside. "'I know it's the collector because he's rapping at every house.' Greenwood did not wait for the door to be opened. He knew very well that Mr. Pennywhiff could not live there. The fourth house at which he knocked was the right one. 
A decent-looking servant girl replied in the affirmative to his inquiry, and he was forthwith conducted to a well-furnished room on the first floor, where he found Mr. Pennywhiffe seated at a table covered with papers. This individual was about fifty years of age. In person he was short, thin, and by no means prepossessing in countenance. His eyes were deeply set, gray, and restless, and his forehead was contracted into a thousand wrinkles. He was dressed in a suit of black and wore a white neckcloth, no doubt to enhance the respectability of his appearance. This was, however, a difficult task, for he had figured in the dock of a criminal tri tribunal. The jury would have for had he figured <laughs> in the dock of a criminal tribunal, the jury, jury would have had no trouble in coming to a verdict, a more hangdog countenance being seldom seen, even in a city where the face is so often the mirror of the mind. Ah, Mr. Greenwood, exclaimed Mr. Pennywhiff, rising to welcome his visitor. This is an unexpected honor. What can I do for you? Pray be seated and speak plainly. There's no listeners here. I require your aid in a most important business, answered Greenwood, taking a chair and throwing back his cloak. Tomorrow I must raise twenty or twenty-five thousand pounds for three or four months upon bills, good bills, Mr. Pennywhiffe. To be deposited, asked the individual. To be deposited, replied Greenwood. Shall you withdraw them in time? Decidedly, I will convert the money I shall thereby raise into a hundred thousand, exclaimed Greenwood. My commission will be heavy for such a business, observed Pennywhiffe, and that, you know, is ready money. I am aware of it, and I am come provided. Name the amount you require. Will two hundred hurt you? Mr. Pennywhiffe said. Remember, the affair is a serious one. You shall have 200 pounds, exclaimed the member of parliament, laying his pocketbook upon the table. That is what I call coming to the point. Mr. Pennywhiffe rose from his seat and opened an iron safe. He took thence a memorandum book and a small tin box. Returning to his seat, he handed the memorandum book to Greenwood, saying, There is my list of noblemen, wealthy gentlemen, and great mercantile firms, whose names are familiar to me. Choose which you will have and make notes of the various sums the bills are to be drawn for. Let them be, for the most part, uneven ones, with fractions. It looks so much better. While Greenwood was employed in examining the memorandum book, which contained upwards of 500 names of peers and great landowners, in addition to those of the chief commercial firms of London, Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, Glasgow, and other places, besides several belonging to Paris, Lyons, Bordeaux, Havre, and Lille, Brussels, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Hamburg, New York, the West Indian Islands, and Montreal, Calcutta, Bombay, Bombay, Bombay and Madras. While well, Mr. Greenwood, we say, was examining this strange register and copying several of the best names of noblemen, gentlemen, and merchants upon a slip of paper, Mr. Pennywhiffe opened his tin case. The contents thereof were numerous paid checks and bills of exchange, respectively bearing the signatures of the persons or firms whose names were entered in the memorandum book. How Mr. Pennywhiffe came, became possessed of such important documents, which, seeing that they had all been duly honored at maturity, ought to have remained in the hands of those who took them up, was a mystery which he kept to himself. Whether he had collected them by degrees or had obtained them in a heap by robbery or any other means, he never condescended to acquaint his clients. I have chosen eleven names, said Greenwood, and have appended to them the various sums for which I require the bills to be drawn. The aggregate is twenty-three thousand two hundred and seventeen pounds, nine shillings, and seven pence halfpenny. A good total, that, observed Mr. Pennywhiffe. An excellent total. Sounds uncommon well. Nothing could be better. Am I to provide the stamps? If you please, I will pay you extra for them. Mr. Pennywhiffe once more had recourse to his iron safe and returned to his seat with a small pasteboard box, long and narrow and containing a vast number of bill stamps adapted to sums of all amounts. As the usual formula of such documents was printed, though in various ways they have been procured at different station or shops, the process of filling them up was by no means a tedious one. But now the ingenuity of Mr. Pennywhiffe mainly exhibited itself. Each bill was filled up with a different ink and a different pen, and so skillful a calligrapher was he that the most astute judge of writing could not possibly have perceived that they were all written by the same hand. Then, by the aid of red ink, a few flourishes, and a little circles containing initial letters or figures, as if each document corresponded with some particular entry in some particular ledger or bill book, the paper speedily assumed a very businesslike appearance. And now the most difficult and delicate part of the entire process was to commence the signatures. But Mr. Pennywhiffe went to work with the air of one who fully understood what he was about, and the originals before him as a, and with the originals before him as a copy, he perfected 
acceptance after acceptance in so masterly a manner that Greenwood, when he compared the fictitious signatures with the genuine, was astounded at the calligraphic proficiency of that man whose dangerous agency he was now rendering available to his purposes. So far as goes well, said Mr. Pennywhiff. The bills are excellent in every point save one, observed Greenwood. Which is that, demanded the calligrapher. They look too new. The paper is too clean. I know it, returned Pennywhiff. But the process is not entirely complete. He rose and threw a quantity of coal upon the fire as to, so as to smother the flame and created a dense smoke. He then passed each bill several times through the smoke until the documents acquired a slightly dingy hue. Lastly, he placed them between the leaves of a portfolio scented with musk so as to take off the odor of the smoke and the entire process was terminated. Mr. Greenwood now counted upon the table banknotes to the aggregate amount of the two hundred pounds promised and the price of the stamps, and in exchange he received the bills for twenty three thousand two hundred and seventeen pounds nine shillings and seven pence halfpenny. This seems to be a most extraordinary neighborhood, Mr. Pennywhiff said Greenwood as he placed the bills in his pocket book. I knocked by mistake at three houses before I came to yours, and the inmates of each seemed to be in difficulties. Now doubt, no doubt of it, my dear sir, this part of London swarms with members of the swell mob, broken down tradesmen, fraudulent bankrupts, insolvents playing hide and seek with the sheriff's officers, railway projectors and swindlers of all kinds. I've got a very strange kind of lodger in my attic. He has no visible means of living, but is out nearly all day long and he dresses uncommonly well. Gold chain, polished boots, figured silk waistcoat, and so forth. He only pays me, or ought to pay me, five shillings a week for his furnished bedroom, and he is six months in arrears. But what is more remarkable still, I don't even know his name. And he never receives any letters, nor has any friends to call on. He is about thirty-six or thirty-eight years old, a good-looking fellow enough, and an Irishman. Perhaps he is also some railway projector, said Mr. Greenwood, rising to take his departure. At this moment, a double knock at the front door was heard. That must be my lodger, exclaimed Mr. Pennywhiff. Urged by curiosity to catch a glimpse of the mysterious gentleman alluded to, Greenwood hurried on his cloak, took leave of the calligrapher, and left the room. On the stairs he met the lodger, who was ascending to his attic with a brass candlestick containing an inch of the commonest candle in his hand. The moment he and Greenwood thus encountered each other, an exclamation of surprise issued from the lips of each. Hush, not a word, said the gentleman, placing his forefinger upon his lips. And of course, Greenwood, he continued in a whisper, you will never mention this to a soul. Never on my honor, answered Greenwood. Then they shook hands and parted, the gentleman continuing his way to the attic and Greenwood hasting to leave the house. Wonders will never cease, thought the latter, as he proceeded towards the cab stand near Rowlands Hill Chapel in the Blackfriars Road. Who would have thought of one of the Irish members of Parliament living in an attic in the new cut? Interesting. So I have a feeling that's going to come back and be important in some way. But, woo. okay, so that's the end of the chapter. Uh, Mr. Greenwood is getting forged uh, IOUs in the names of uh, some prominent people and prominent companies to place as collateral on the money he's going to get loaned to him. He's so convinced he's going to make a profit on it, he'll be able to buy back the IOUs, and then no one will be the wiser. I suspect it's not going to work as well as he thinks. So, all right, we'll see what happens in the next chapter.